Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Why these countries on this list? And you get, I'll give you off the top of my head the easy answers. The easy answers are, oh, well, Barack Obama came up with this list, James. What you've got to realise is that Barack Obama came up with this list and these countries, that's simply not true. Then you'll get the references to the six-month ban that uh, apparently Barack Obama put in place for Iraqi refugees. There's two things wrong with that. This is what you have to, I think, start doing now, is you have to start unpicking the whataboutery before it gets traction. It's probably too late because, of course, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got his trousers on. But immediately this ban came out. The usual suspects, the usual white supremacist news sites, use the word news very loosely, were trying to argue that, uh, oh, well, Israelis are banned from lots of Arab countries. That's exactly the same. Why does nobody ever complain about that? To which the answer, if I really need to explain, is simple, that some Arab countries, some Muslim countries, uh, accept the United Nations judgment that Israel is guilty of war crimes and therefore take a decision to sanction that sovereign government in Israel with a restriction of travel for its citizens until that sovereign government um, uh, falls into line with international law. It's that simple. Donald Trump isn't doing that. He is not saying these governments are breaking international law, therefore we will sanction their citizens until the government changes his tune. He's saying, oh, yeah, these guys, these guys are dangerous. And I don't have to prove it. I don't want to prove it. I've got no proof, but I'm going to ban them anyway because I know my fans will love it. And he's right. Then you've got the... Uh, what, is, what are the other water batteries that are doing the rounds this morning? We've got, we got the one about the, the six-month ban on Iraqi refugees coming into America back in 2013 or, or 2011. Not true. Simply not true. Two things wrong with that observation. The first is that Barack Obama insisted that all Iraqis that arrived in America were re-vetted after two of them were found to have been involved in terror attacks outside America, back in Iraq. Fingerprints were found on bomb debris, and therefore it was uh, ordered by the Department for Homeland Security that they go back over the paperwork and find out whether or not they might be anybody else that had slipped through the proverbial cracks. This added to a massive backlog of applications. The criteria was temporarily higher than usual, and as a result of that, the number of Iraqis arriving in America went down. Didn't go down to zero, but it went down by a few thousand. They carried on arriving. The only news report you'll be able to find referring to this so-called six-month ban on Iraqi refugees comes from a 2013 article published by ABC News. But of course, as soon as they find that article, the Trumpians go nuts. They find one article referring to one misunderstood piece of legislation and they hold that up as proof that Donald Trump hasn't done anything wrong. So where are we now? It's really, really easy to describe and explain. We're in a place now where, for Donald Trump supporters, the news is whatever they want it to be. Whatever they want it to be. For everybody else, the news is chilling. For everybody else, the news is absolutely terrifying. They've already burnt down a mosque in Texas. Oh, that's got nothing to do with Donald Trump. Hang on a minute. He's signed an executive order that effectively classes American Muslims from these seven countries as second-class citizens. Once you actually formalize the notion of an, of an untermensch, an inferior human being, somebody who does not deserve the same rights under the law, the same protections, the same fundamental principles of universal human rights, you are a Nazi. Unter untermensch is, is their word. Someone who is less human than you. And I think on a very personal level, if I've made a mistake over the last couple of years, as we've tracked and predicted almost all of this, I think canary in the coal mine is, is, is the phrase that one interviewer used recently. The one thing I've missed is, is just presuming so naively that everybody gets repulsed by that. Everybody gets repulsed by the idea of a hierarchy of humanity. Because this little snowflake presumes that if you are a human, then a hierarchy of humanity will chill you to the core. A hierarchy of humanity. What do you think this ban does? Oh, it protects America. No, it doesn't. Because if it was really designed to do that, Saudi Arabia would be at the top of the list. It would still be bogus. It would still be largely unworkable. And it would still be mostly meaningless. But it wouldn't be fundamentally fraudulent if Saudi Arabia were on the list. Or Egypt. Or plenty of other countries where Mr. Trump has business interests. 
So what is it designed to do? It's easy. It's designed to create an atmosphere in which mosques get burned down, already happened, and in which worshippers get shot, already happened, in Canada. Although, because I'm a proper journalist, I tell you now that one French news agency has reported that one of the shooters, one of the suspects arrested in response to the six killings in Quebec is reported to be of Tunisian or, or Moroccan origin. Now, I tell you that because it doesn't matter to me what ethnicity he is or what background he has. I don't consider a crime to be worse if the perpetrator was a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian. I consider a crime's badness to be determined by its impact and commission, not by the colour of the perpetrator. But this is an unfashionable view now. So look at all the people who suddenly care about women's rights when it's a, a brown man allegedly groping a white woman, but who cheer it to the rafters when it's a white president allegedly groping a succession of white women. That's the definition of racism. You react differently to the same action according to the colour of the person that did it. That's the definition of racism. Definition of Nazism, it's a little harder to pin down, but I'll give you a very, very good starting point. Three human beings. Do they have equal, fundamental, universal value? No. I'm going to judge their value according to things over which they have no control, like the religion they were born into, the country they were born in, or the origins that they display. And that, my friends, is where we are. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.52 is the time. Why do you think Donald Trump has brought in this so-called Muslim ban? You could, like my last incredibly well-informed caller, Sammy, uh, derive enormous security, enormous confidence from the notion that the intelligence services have provided the backdrop for these seven countries to be targeted, and I'm going to try to. But, of course, you have to remember these are the same intelligence services that last week Donald Trump compared to Nazi Germany and has been roundly deriding ever since he achieved office. But maybe, maybe the fears of some sort of Nazi shadow are a little premature. The only problem is, of course, that every time you find yourself deriving some reassurance from the thought that they might be premature, they double down with an action like this one. Richard is in Windsor. Richard, why do you think he's doing it? Um, hey, James. Uh, first of all, you've set the precedent, so shall I settle in for a 20-minute call? Uh, no. I, I, the, you know, I can't <laughs> I win. You, you see, if, 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 I, um, if I hadn't spoken to Sammy for 20 minutes, I'd be accused of, of, of cutting him off and not letting him speak. And when I do speak to him for 20 minutes, I'll get accused of, of pro-Israeli bias, and I only let him talk for ages, and I'd never let a Muslim caller do that. But, hey, that's why they pay me the big bucks. What do you want to say, Richard? As a listener, I enjoy those calls, just, just for the record. Yes, I think um, most okay. people do. Especially, um, especially, especially when my buttocks emerged a little pinker, perhaps, than they were <laughs> that when I went into it. It never hurts. It never hurts. <laughs> um, so, so the first thing I would say is uh, this isn't a defend. I'm not defending Donald Trump, but I think you have to take this current policy um, into context of, of the type of person he is and the career that he has had. This is, as far as I can see, effectively a typical first move in any negotiation, straight from his book which is where he talks about making the big first offer that seems crazy or unacceptable, but it has the advantage of making any subsequent offers automatically seem more reasonable. So I would fully expect in the next week, couple of weeks, couple of months, for this blanket ban on these people from these countries coming in to go away and be replaced with some form of enhanced extreme vetting, but no blanket ban. Well, that's in. That's already on the on the table. I, but this this is. I, I mean, this is really where it becomes an article of faith. Because after ninety days, there's going to be a review, and you're saying you think he'll retreat from where he is now. Yes. I and I I'm, look. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. My fear is that he'll he'll go further. And and you know the big cheerleaders for Donald Trump, they might not let him retreat. Well, I, I think that's part of, part of the negotiation position by him taking a position like this it allows him to win with both sides. Let's say in a hypothetical universe, in 60 days' time, this ban goes away, they do the review, and it, it, it's replaced by some other form of vetting. But they can't do that. But that would involve, wouldn't that involve them coming back and saying, oh, look, it turns out they're not all bad. And the whole point of the core support, and, and by that I don't mean the, the, the percentage of people that voted for Donald Trump, I mean the ones that were persuaded by the anti-Islamic rhetoric, to come back and say to them, actually... No need to panic. I mean, look at Breitbart. Look at the website that's published by his chief of staff. I just can't ever imagine circumstances in which they'll go, false alarm, guys, nothing to see here, everything's cool. 
Well, I, it, won't, it won't be that. That won't be how they'll spin it. They'll spin it that this new enhanced verification process, whatever it becomes, if, if you and I were to look at it today in isolation, we would describe it as unacceptable. But yes. in the context of the ban that he's now introduced, it will look moderate. And not only will people accept it, they'll welcome it. There's a million people who have signed that petition now to keep him out of the country. When he gets rid of this ban and replaces it by something that is potentially equally as outrageous, they'll consider that a victory. And that's what he's doing. That, I mean, I hate to say it, he's kind of playing us like a fiddle. Well, it looks that way. It's and, and, a uh, manipulation technique. You, well, again, I mean, I would hope you were right and that this would be a position from which he retreated. History doesn't necessarily suggest that that is a position to which you can ascribe much confidence. And just in the interests of fact-checking, um, uh, Donald Trump does have business interests in Indonesia and the president, the prime minister of Malaysia, is described as his um, best golfing buddy. So in answer to the question of why Indonesia and Malaysia aren't on that list, which was posed earlier, well, n now we know. Jason is in Watford. Jason, why do you think he's doing it? Ego. Ego? So an ego. I so mean, are, you, are, you address are you addressing me now, or are you answering my question? No, no you, we know about your ego. <laughs> Donald, Donald, Donald Trump actually trumps you, excuse the pun. That's but funny. no, he, he's, look, it's all about ego. It's, it is... If you try and break down the logic behind it, there isn't any logic because, as you've pointed out a lot on this show, there are so many Americans that kill each other in America. And so, if you actually say, "Oh, if we, let's let's deal with with uh, with uh, attacks," the attacks are coming from within. But if he would have stood up and said, oh, "I'm going to sort out the American gun law," "I'm going to stop Americans from killing Americans," do you think he would be president now? We wouldn't be having this conversation now. No, but what if he said, "What if he said American Muslims"? Well, then, then he still would be president because the fact is, I think we're all being a bit naive that there's, there's a huge racist part of, of America that are clearly against anything other than America. So they're the ones that I think that have potentially made him president and he wanted to come in and say, I said I'm going to do this and I've done it. I, I could turn around and say today that I'm going to buy LBC radio off of, uh, off of Global. But he says, I'm going to build a wall. He's building a wall. He hasn't explained where the money's coming from to actually build the wall, other than saying the Mexicans are going to pay for it. So this is, this is, this is I think, similar to what I meant by being hostage to his own mythology, in a way. Absolutely. 100%. So there's no logic to what he's doing or, or saying, other than ego. Look, I think all of, none of us want to see the rise of terrorism. But the fact is, in America, terrorism is about the smallest problem that they've got. So when it comes to killing people, that is literally should be at the bottom of their list because it's not really an issue. And it, well, it is, it is dwarfed by lawnmowers. Absolutely. I don't undermine the, the, the families of people that have been killed in horrible terrorist attacks. But, but it, on the grand scheme of things, it's not a big issue in comparison to everything else that's going on in America. But his ego has said, I'm going to deal with this. So he's got to come along and say, oh, in the first two weeks of being president, this is what I've done. And that's all, all about ego. There's no logic. It doesn't matter about logic. But I, I, can you derive comfort from that? If it's just his ego? Because then the ramifications... So what, what, what's the worst case scenario in terms of where it might lead? Look, my, my theory is, my worst case scenario, my children get upset when I say it, yes. is Donald Trump could be the beginning of the end of the world as we know it. Could be. You didn't find any comfort in, in, in Sammy's very well-informed call earlier? Look, Sammy had a lot of logic in what he was saying, but Sammy's also a very intelligent person. But at the end of the day, this isn't this isn't about intelligence. And I do agree that there's something that does need to be done because I do believe this is a huge problem, and I do believe that a lot of this is a. But it's hard to see. It's hard to see how this is going to render anybody safer than they were yesterday or or, or the day before. It's coming up to eleven o'clock. We'll stick with this. Um, I don't think you need me to explain why. Some phone lines free now. You know the number. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. I struggle to shake off my fears that we're looking at something profoundly sinister unfolding on the other side of the Atlantic. And a large part of the reason for that is the recorded thoughts of the man who has become Donald Trump's chief of staff, a former publisher of the white supremacist website Breitbart, um, and his recorded desire to see society and civilization destroyed, to see the state brought down. 
whether or not I'm right or wrong to somehow link that to the notion of um, this Muslim ban. And, and he wanted a Muslim ban. Rudy Giuliani, whether he was speaking out of school or not, told Fox News a couple of days ago that Donald Trump asked him to look into the legality of a, of a straight Muslim ban. But I want to ask you about this ban. I want to ask you about this ban and the protest. Does the ban have anything to do with religion? How did the president decide the seven countries? Uh, I understand the permanent ban on the refugees. Okay. Uh, and, okay, I'll talk to me. Tell you the whole history of it. So right. when he first announced it, he said Muslim ban. He called me up. He said, put a commission together. Show me the right way to do it legally. I put a commission together with Judge Mukasey, with Congressman McCall, Pete King, whole group of other very expert lawyers on this. And what we did was we focused on, instead of religion, danger. The right. air areas of the world that create danger for us. It seems to me to be designed to create, in the eyes of American people, the notion of an Untermensch, an inferior human being, based upon religion, in the same way that the Jewish Untermensch was based upon their religion. And you see them burning down a mosque in Texas. You see some of the stuff on social media about how no, no, none of them should be allowed into this country. It's incompatible with Western values. I'd say he was halfway there on doing that. But what's in it for him? Why would he want to sow such enmity and division? Four minutes after 11 is the time. 0345 606973 is the number that you need. Chris is in Dromfield. Chris, lovely part of the world. What would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Hello, Chris. Um, it's second time caller. I called you last time um, in the wake of uh, Joe Cox's um, tragic death. So okay. I must make a point of calling for happier times in the future. Yes, try and get on um, Mystery Hour. That, that generally is a slightly yeah. more slightly more upbeat experience. Um, I, I, I share a lot of your fears about this, but I think that actually, in in some sense, what Trump is doing has nothing to do with Muslims. I think it has more to do with solidifying his political base and attempting to secure a second term. And I think the reason that they're trying to do that is because I think a lot of what Trump does through the campaign and through what he's doing now is um, about controlling knowledge um, and about making a, a real sharp differentiation between the sort of more liberal left and, and his um, standing. and. The way they're doing that is because they understand that organizations like Facebook are now the most popular news outlet. And when it comes to unpicking these kind of disastrous policies, you need to have quite a detailed conversation. But we're not living in a world where people are finding it easy to have the kind of conversations that your esteemed colleague Majid Nawaz and Sam Harris had in their great book, Islam and the Future of Tolerance. Um, that what we live in now is a sort of too long didn't read um everyone's culture. picked a side haven't they yeah everyone's picked a side you have massive confirmation bias and yes. everybody now is able to pick out what they have on their little it's called a news feed on facebook for a reason um but most of it's fake um, or unverifiable and so we those of us who are sort of more liberal leaning are, are starting from a massive um, disadvantage. Here's, here's the fear. You, you're dealing with people who feel like they've already got the facts. Yeah, but don't don't um, you find, and I, I wonder whether I've been guilty of this, probably, don't you find that when that position on, quotes, the other side is so entrenched and so rooted in, in often in falsehood, often in so-called fake news, you just use the word liberal to, to, to dis I mean, wh where's the middle ground? Because I wonder whether now you're, people are so freaked out by what they're seeing and so fearful yeah. of, of what it may augur, yeah. what it may represent, that they're possibly falling into bad habits themselves and, and, and reaching too easily for, for weapons that haven't been properly primed. Yeah, that's true, um, and, I, and I, um, I, I understand as well that we're falling more and more into kind of identity politics um and 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 yeah it is misguided to throw around terms like liberal because it, it, again I, i'm i'm immediately allying myself with the other side aren't i i'm not starting from a position well, well, exa exactly because like we that, do yeah. we use liberal as a synonym now to just simply yeah. mean someone who doesn't think you should be punished if you haven't done anything wrong or trump sees it as somebody who's just soft yeah quite um it's not a it's not about in his eyes it's not about somebody who supports conversation they support secularism human rights you know a strive for equality. universal um, human rights which is the weirdest thing absolutely. isn't it to try and have an argument about because what you're really saying to people who are arguing with you is i think it's really important that you are never 
prosecuted for, 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 for a relatively harmless belief that you have. I, I, I think it's really important that you were never beaten up because of the religion that you were born yeah. into. I think it's really important that your daughter is never groped by a silverback gorilla and then excused as locker room talk subsequently, or groped by yeah. a brown person or a white person or a green person or a purple person. That's what universal means, and yet people scream back at you from the perspective of, of already having bought into the idea that one of those groups is demonstrably inferior to, to all of the others, or more to be yeah. feared. And Steve Bannon knows all too well that people who are his base and understand it will have already turned off from this conversation that we're having now because we sound like a pair of elites who are uh, ignoring the elephant in the room, which is ISIS, that wants to blow us all up. And But the people uh, running away from ISIS, are the people running away from ISIS are the victim of this ban. Yeah, but, you know, bag of Skittles, James, you know, the people that are running away, ISIS are going to capitalise on that and hide somebody in that group of people. That and, and the bag of Skittles, up. that is how you impose a hierarchy of humanity. The bag of Skittles, for people not familiar yeah. with it, is, is an internet meme, predictably enough, picked up by one of Donald Trump's sons. And the suggestion is that because there might be a poison Skittle in the bag, you should never eat another Skittle again, which would involve a complete ban on all... Well, you can't even say Muslims anymore, can you, in that, in that sort of context? Because you'd have to ban everybody who might even possibly be a Muslim or, or, or have sympathies in that direction. Yeah, you don't have to start there, James. You can start with policies like this. And then actually, perversely, the, the, you know, the biggest fear now for me is that there will be a significant terror attack on American soil in reprisal for this kind of thing, because Lord knows this is giving ammunition to ISIS if ever it needed it. Um, and that kind of attack will be used much the same as Bush used 9-11 um, to settle some scores. And Trump will then use that kind of fear that comes about from that, that kind of attack to then tighten the grip so that these... Well, that's these my fear, but, that, but I do derive some... Because, policies. Forgive me. You, yeah, I mean, so this is, a, this is like a, 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 almost poking the tiger, as it were, in the hope that it will... Yeah growl and, and, yeah. and, and bite back. So you endanger America in order to be able to, 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 to go even further against, against its perceived enemies. I, I hear you. I have to say, and I'll refer back a few times, I think, to Sammy's call, because it was, it was so powerful, and, and he, he certainly schooled me on some areas. I'm not, not waving a white flag, but, but when I hear someone like that, he didn't sound to me like a man who is desperate to have uh, all Muslims cast as second-class citizens, to have people judged by the, the by, by the religion into which they were born. There are, and maybe these are the people, to go back to the point you began by making, we need to hear a bit more from, are those who are persuaded by some of these policies, but not for the reasons that we posit. We posit racism, we posit bigotry, prejudice, and to mention, maybe there are some slightly less toxic rationales for supporting these sort of ideas, no? Yeah, absolutely. And um, Sammy's call, which started off angering me in some ways, ended up actually giving me hope that yeah, me the conversation too. can change people's minds and meet people and meet, you know, minds in the middle, despite the fact that they appear to be starting from positions of conflict. So, um, yeah. Yes, and, and that, that is the danger. And, and I suppose just this sort of little three hour oasis that we get every day on LBC where it isn't just shouting yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. We do the occasional maybe. Chris, thank you. As you said, let's make sure the third call to the programme comes on perhaps cheerier territory. Um, Owen is in Dundee. Owen, what would you like to say? Um, I'm, I'm uh, sort of more concerned of what uh, all this means for the United Kingdom as a whole, to be honest. It's, Go on. um, it's when you look at what at Theresa May's reaction to the whole thing, it was very uh, delayed and it wasn't very. It doesn't feel like it's very sincere, um, because you know she she comes she comes along. They ask her, you know, what do you think about this? She says, uh, I believe there was a bit of a delay before she uh, commented on it, and then she just commented, oh, it's unacceptable. But we all yeah, but she just got off a plane, Owen. I, and I'm not here to hold Theresa May's hand. I think that vacancy has already been filled. But you you know what it's like, and I know they're in touch with the media. But she's she's she's. So sort of hijacked by this and she did go further over the course of the weekend she did make it clear that they disapprove of it and then she did get Amber Rudd and Boris Johnson to phone their opposite numbers in America and make sure that, that yeah. British um, people from these countries were somehow exempt from the ban which doesn't really make sense if it's a security issue but in terms of her position it, it, it's a little more charitable yeah. than perhaps you were I mean my biggest problem with sending Amber Rudd which I mean thing with Amber Rudd is that you yourself a few months ago uh, called her out on her speech at Tory party conference 
which was... Um, I'm not going to have to defend her now, am I, from my own successful <laughs> illustration of how similar her speech was to Mein Camp. But I don't think... I mean, look, there's no earthly way. It yeah. was intended as a Nazi policy. It was intended just to quieten all of those people obsessed with immigration, and they made an epic, epic misjudgment. And to their credit, yeah, sure. once, once I'd pointed that out, it, it, it disappeared from the policy proposal sheet almost overnight. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's just, you know, she, she Theresa May sent asking people to call uh, their United States counterparts. Mm. You know, it just feels, it, it, it feels like it would fall, it feels like these people would not have no actual feet to stand on. When uh, and, and, and then the shadow of Brexit appears as well, because we will never know. We will never know whether yeah, or not exactly. the um, desperation, which is what it looks like to secure a trade deal with America, would be the same if we hadn't decided already to come out of the European Union. Because you know? there is a huge gap in our yeah. uh, collective balance book, our collective pocketbook that needs to be filled in some way. The books need to be balanced. And maybe that means that we're, mm. we're, we're going to... Maybe that means that Theresa May, the vicar's daughter, is going to allow her moral compass to be somewhat compromised by the pragmatic necessity of Donald Trump's dollars. Exactly, yeah. Now I'm worried about that as well. It's coming up to 11.15. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, you know, you take the mickey out of me on Twitter on days like this. You say, I suppose you'll be talking about parking tickets again today, will you, James? And I hilariously reply saying, yep, you got it, three hours of parking tickets. The story that intrigues me most, away from the world of international politics and the looming threat of World War Three, the story that intrigues me most today is, in a very, very loose sense, about parking tickets. But whether or not we have any appetite or indeed uh, desire to move on to that after 12 o'clock today, only time will tell. I, I, I'm, I'm staying with this um, for the time being. The question is a very straightforward one, but the answers are anything but. Why do you think Donald Trump has instituted this ban on these seven countries at this time. 0345 6060 973. It's 1115. 0345 6060 973 is the number you'll need in the uh, no, no, inevitable event of there becoming a phone line into the studio free at some time in the near future. Remember, as soon as I bid farewell to somebody like Kerry or James who are up next, then it frees up a phone line for you. Looking at this so-called Muslim ban, which they say isn't a Muslim ban, but then somewhat embarrassingly for Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani pops up on Fox News, which of course used to be um, <laughs> the second largest shareholder in the holding company, used to be a member of the Saudi Arabian royal family. Uh, Rudy Giuliani pops up there to say that actually Donald Trump did ask him to look into a uh, the legality of a ban on all Muslims coming into the country, but but they didn't necessarily think they could deliver on that. So they've picked seven uh, countries, none of which have yet exported a jihadist terrorist to the United States of America, but which um, have somehow been identified as those posing the biggest threats. And then you look at the countries that aren't on the list, like Saudi Arabia or indeed Malaysia or Indonesia with huge Muslim populations, and they all have one thing in common. No prizes for guessing what it is. Business interests of Mr. Trump and Sons. And actually, in some cases, it goes even further. The Prime Minister of Malaysia has been described in, in, in many quarters as Donald Trump's best golfing buddy. And one of his big business mates in Indonesia is thinking about running for political office. So every time you sort of think, maybe maybe things aren't that bad. And we took a call in the last hour that did make me think, maybe, maybe I'm getting a bit hysterical. And then, of course, Twitter being Twitter, you get bombarded with all the... Uh, Evidence to the contrary. No, James, Malaysia and Indonesia really are in bed with him already. Um, that will be the reason why they're not on the list. I remember, I told you this, didn't I? Years and years and years ago. I got in a taxi in Malaysia. And this is going back before my kids were born. And there was a picture of Osama bin Laden dangling from the rearview mirror. I've never been so frightened in my life. Just dangling like a sort of like, you know, I've got a kid of Mr. Harrier's emblem in the Volvo. He had a picture of Osama bin Laden. And you sort of think, whoa. But anyway, they're still fine to travel. He's still fine to travel. 21 minutes after 11. Kerry is in Ealing. Kerry, why do you think he's done this? What's this ban really about? Or maybe it's about what it's... Maybe it does what it says on the tin. I don't know. Good morning, James. Yeah. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I agree with you um, in terms of the, the fact that we should all be afraid. I feel that um, this is a precursor. And I think that the reason that um, Trump has issued this list is because of the operations that he's planning to wipe out Islamic extremist terrorism, just as he promised during his campaign. And I think you were right to, to point out we should be looking to his advisers, particularly Steve Bannon, to see where, where this is all going next. 
Yeah, I think um, the, on the news this morning there was a uh, an operation against Al Qaeda in Yemen, which seems well, no, to be I, 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 that, that's not going to worry many people, is it? An, an operation against Al Qaeda in, in in Yemen. I think they call themselves something else in in, in Yemen, but um. Why would that be a bad thing? I, I, the one thing I think everyone would be fairly comfortable with is taking these ISIS barbarians and kicking them back into into the 15th century. Agreed. I just think this is a statement of intent. I think he plans to <clears throat> to wipe out ISIS and wipe out Al Qaeda. This is what he's well, that's promised. fine by this me. What he wants to this is what he wants to be seen to be done, and I'm not a fan, but um, I do think there is a, a method to his madness. But he can do all of that without casting the residency of half a million green card holders into doubt, can't he? He can do all of that. He can just announce military action on the other side of the world, despite kind of saying the other day that they weren't going to do that. He can announce all of that without bringing in a ban on entry into, into the United States on people who are running away from the countries that they're already bombing. Of course, and this is just a sign of uh, his uh, unfitness for office. If, <laughs> See, I, my fears go further than yours. I, I think just like Putin, he, he needs some sort of military escalation in order to distract attention from what's going on at home and it will become very clear very soon at home in america that he's not going to be able to reopen coal mines or magic jobs out of thin air for all of the people who sent him to washington to be fair they sent him to washington to break the system not to work within it they feel so disenfranchised so let down by the status quo that a significant part of his vote that isn't actually islamophobic or racist because they were tempted to vote for bernie sanders before hillary clinton got the nod from the democrats they just feel so completely abandoned by the quotes system end quotes they send donald trump to washington to break it the problem is as you say the people he took with him. And um, there's some astonishing uh, uh, stuff emerging now about his chief of staff. It's, it's too many Asian CEOs in Silicon Valley. Uh, an observation he made, this Steve Bannon guy, based apparently on a completely made-up statistic. This was in November of 2015 when Steve Bannon interviewed Donald Trump for a Breitbart radio program. Um, <laughs> starts with Trump riffing about how to top foreign-born Ivy League graduates should be allowed to stay in America where they can be job creators, and Bannon spoke up to disagree. Trump says, we have to keep our talented people in this country. Bannon says, um, Trump says, I think you agree with that. Do you agree with that? He says, well, I, I, got, I got a tougher, you know, when two thirds or three quarters of the CEOs in Silicon Valley are from South Asia or, or, or from Asia, I think on my point is a, is a country's more like a country's more than an economy. We're a civic society. So first of all, that two thirds or three quarters figure is, is, isn't even close to being true, but why would it matter? Does that mean that the fact that all, the, all these woolly liberals like me think the fact that Steve Jobs' biological father was a Syrian refugee, a Syrian migrant, we think that's a deal breaker. Ah, you'd, you'd have banned Steve Jobs' father from this country. And people like Steve Bannon would turn around and go, yeah, exactly. So we think we've got what they call a zinger. Ha <laughs> ha, zing! Steve Jobs' biological father was a Syrian refugee. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have Apple. And you think you've won. Ah, oh, well, all right, then we can't ban all Syrians. But people like Steve Bannon will go, yeah, no, that's fine by me, actually. He, he is, you know, Syrian. James is in Brixton. James, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, it's like to say, I share a lot of your fears and think it's a fairly kind of terrifying policy um, that he's implementing. But he recognises that we spend a lot of time attacking politicians for not doing what they say in their manifestos. Yes. And actually, Trump is implementing a lot of things that he said exactly is what he's going to do before he got elected. So he's been elected on... Okay, a fairly terrifying set of things, but um, he's now implementing exactly what he said he would. Yeah, the problem is, this is like Brexit. There are a lot of um, Brexit echoes, aren't there? Because the, the, you remember yeah. the single market argument we had last week, or debate, or, 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 or heated conversation, where all the people on the Remain side had said, we will have to leave the single market. All the people on the Leave side said, we wouldn't. And then when it emerged that we did, suddenly the Remain side were trusted and believable, and we knew all along that we were going to have to. All the people who liked Trump kept saying things like, don't take him literally, take him seriously. Don't take him literally, take him seriously. The difference with that is that the Leave side in the Brexit vote all saying we wouldn't have to leave the single market, whereas Trump was actually saying that he would be doing these but, things. But his cheerleaders were saying, oh no, he's, I mean, take him seriously, but don't take him literally. Do you remember when, what's the chops? Um, Kellyanne Conway said, don't concentrate on his words. It's before he got elected, I think. Don't concentrate on the actual words coming out of his actual mouth. Concentrate on what's in his heart. No, I agree. And I don't think anyone really knows what's in his heart. But, um... No. But no, you're right. But in terms of the short-term political pragmatism, then the, the, the core support will be delighted. Yeah, he's doing what he said he'd yeah, do. And I think, and I think by, by attacking him 
Oh, sorry, I'll take AT badly. But I think there are a lot, the reason he got in, and with the same reason for Brexit, there's a lot of people who feel left behind and very disenfranchised. And if everyone charges in and says, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, and even Donald Trump, who's seen as a kind of ulti anti establishment figure, can't be, isn't going to do what he said he was going to do, then that's only going to make the problem worse, surely. And in four years' time, you're going to have something even more extreme. Yeah, I, and I'm going to sort of cling to, to the caller from... Um Sammy in the last hour, who is very persuasive on the point that this is just a perfectly rational response to published intelligence, which I'm waiting to have a look at, and that these seven countries do pose a much more real and meaningful threat. But then, of course, the problem is that some of the other countries we threw into that mix, turns out they do have um, business links with Donald Trump. And if it really does boil down, even with a sort of 5% wriggle room, that the, quotes, majority Muslim, end quotes, countries that are on the list are pretty much the only ones where he hasn't got business interests, then you know how that conversation played out between him and Steve Bannon. So Bannon says, we've got to go in on this, 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 and this. And Trump says, well, we can't do that. I've got a hotel there. I can't, I can't, I can't be trying to flog bedrooms in a city uh, while simultaneously telling the residents that they're not allowed to come to the country I'm in charge of. How am I ever going to get rid of the honeymoon suite if these people aren't allowed to come to America on their honeymoon? It's that simple, right? For him, he's a businessman. He deals in, in broad brushstrokes. He has a honeymoon suite uh, in Cairo or wherever it may be, and he can't possibly sign away an order that tells people who've just booked the honeymoon suite in his hotel in Egypt aren't allowed to come to America on their honeymoon. But he ain't got no business dealings in Syria or in Iraq or elsewhere, so they can go on the list. And you're looking for the reasons for why those names are on that list? It's hard to resist the conclusion that we just arrived at. Although, once again, I'd love to resist it. The way things are looking on the switchboard and at the clock, I have to tell you, um, I, I, I could easily carry on with this until one o'clock, which I'm minded to do, as ever on the programme. The quality of the calls is, is, is knocking everybody else in the so-called phone-in business into a cocked hat. But if you feel a need for a change of air come 12, just let me know in all the usual ways, and I shall run you through some of the other stories that caught my eye. Um, earlier. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we contemplate the various explanations for Donald Trump's decision to ban visitors from seven specific Muslim majority countries from coming to the United Kingdom. And, well, very simply put, the most charitable reading that we've received is that there are clear and present reasons for banning the residents the citizens, the refugees fleeing these specific countries, as opposed to any of the others that have had a more demonstrable relationship with terrorism on American territory in recent years. Um, but that is, you know, kind of a positive, isn't it? It's not all bad. There are some reasons why this may not be a precursor to the recasting of a 21st century untermensch, but that's still how it looks to me. If, if I ever retire, and <laughs> the way things are going financially, it's highly unlikely that uh, any of us will ever retire, isn't it? But if I ever do hang up my headphones, I'd love to do a PhD thesis on, on, on actual news selection. I'm intrigued by the story today about the House of Commons launching an inquiry into so-called fake news, and some of the examples they threw up. Do you know that the top 20 fake news stories in the run-up to the American election. This is, historians of the future will puzzle for a while over how the hell Donald Trump ever got elected. And then they'll just stumble across this little nugget. The top 20 fake news, as in demonstrably false, not as in open to interpretation or differences of opinion, demonstrably, demonstrably false, stone-cold made-up stories, got more traction on social media prior to the American election last year than the top 20 real news stories. And that should be the moment where a bell tolls. In fact, if, if Axel had been on the ball this morning, I think he would have lent on the bell tolling button when I said that. The top 20 stories that are demonstrably made up got more traction, more retweets, more views, more shares on social media than the top 20 stories that were true. But there's the mystery of how he got elected solved in a nutshell. And some of these stories getting half a million hits, including one about 19 white bodies being found in a freezer with the words Black Lives Matter carved onto their carcasses, that went around the world and back before the truth had even got his trousers on. And that, that's where we are now. But if I ever do have the opportunity to retire, then um, uh, I'll, I'll be looking at the, 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 the question of news selection. So I used to sit in the newsroom at the newspaper I used to work for and think, how do we decide? You'd sit in conference and the editor decides, but usually, very rarely does anyone swim against the tide. How big a story do you think this should be? 
The former KGB operative, who is believed to have cooperated most with the former MI6 spy who put together that Donald Trump dossier containing unconfirmed allegations that would, if true, very much leave him in the pocket of Vladimir Putin, was found dead in his car in Russia just before Christmas. How big a deal is that, do you think? Because this is perhaps where the disconnect is between, to break it down in a very binary fashion, people who like Trump and people who are chilled to the core by his very existence. If People who, who, who are freaked out by Donald Trump were putting the same effort into spreading stories, whether true or false, to support their position as the people who like Donald Trump are putting into spreading their stories, which are mostly but not entirely false, in order to support their position, then the suspicious death of the former KGB man who was reportedly the biggest source for the former MI6 man's dossier into Donald Trump's alleged um, behaviour in a Moscow hotel suite. The fact that he's been found dead in his car in Russia in suspicious circumstances. Do you see what I mean? In an alternative universe, that would be on every front page in the land. But it's not. I don't really know why. Uh, where should we go next? Cambridge or Tring? Let's go to Cambridge. Ian is there. Ian, what would you like to say? I was just, I was just listening to what you were saying, according to... Sort your phone line out, Ian. Sort your phone line. Take your balaclava helmet off. Remove your hand from the mouthpiece. I want to hear your every syllable in crystal clear clarity. Try again. Can you hear me now? No, that's even worse. We'll try and sort that out and come back to you in a minute. I'm going to tring where Jeremy is. Jeremy, what would you like to say? Uh, well, to answer your uh, first question, which was why he did it, uh, previous caller got to that before I could, and that he said he would do it. <clears throat> it was one of his campaign promises. But I think... His campaign promise it was to ban Muslims, and he's been at yeah. pains over the last 24 hours to insist that this isn't a ban yeah. on Muslims. So it's kind of classic Trump in a way, in that you can say he's delivering on the promise he made, but at the same time he's saying he's not, which is why many of us are so perturbed by his performance. He's not delivering on the promise he made. How do you know that, James? Because he said he isn't. Okay. So that was to answer that point, but to... Um... Except it didn't. Yes, it did. Oh, well, it didn't, because he uh, says it's not a Muslim ban. See, but this is, this is part of my bigger argument that I've been having with people on both sides. Um, because I'm willing to listen to all points of rational debate, yes. no matter where I may come down on the particular things, because on every policy I believe that everybody has a valid point of view. But I think the problem in, in where we're at now is because everything is so divisive. There, I mean, another previous caller, because I've been listening since 10, Good has man. said that there is no middle anymore. No, there You're isn't. Either on one side or the other. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if you try to agree with somebody on the other side about something, well, then, you know, you're just wrong. By default, if you don't agree with me, then you're wrong. Whereas usually, other than the loud extremes on both sides, the middle, the people that get drummed out, people that don't get heard, yes. by the way, are the people that have... They don't get hired, they don't get columns, they don't get radio shows, you, 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 you know, they, it's they, going out of fashion. Exactly. They get ignored. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's where the problem is. It's, it's, it's got to do with the divisiveness. And I think the other problem is, you know, like you say, with Trump, there doesn't... He, he, anticip he um, intensifies this by the fact that there is really no middle ground for him as a person. So either... <laughs> This is his age. This is his age. This is his era, isn't it? By coincidence and design, he could not have been in the position he's in at a more re useful time for someone like him. They, because you either you either really really like him, or, or you really really don't as a person. And see, the problem for me, and and uh, and a lot of people is the policies. So, like the Republican Party, which is uh, I'm a member of. Yes. Um. The policies, you know, you, you, I try to, uh, not all, but some, most, the majority, I, I, I tend to uh, align with and agree with. So, you know, you, that is who you had in the election to choose but, but But when you have Mike Pence describing a Muslim ban as divisive and unconstitutional, he's yeah. deleted the tweet now. What do you, when you say you're a member of the Republican Party and you agree with most of their policies, do you mean you agree with the Republican Party as represented by Mike Pence or the Republican Party as represented by the self-declared Democrat Donald Trump? See, this is the problem that most of the people that, uh, like, you know, are in the same uh, boat as I am, is, is you've got, because, you know, you have to try to pick out the policies, and, and, and it's really difficult. But, you know, the election that we had back home, it left us with, 
it was such a difficult one because you had somebody who was the exact antithesis of everything everybody didn't want. Yeah. But then you had this unpopular figure, but at least he wasn't he wasn't in the mainstream. He sounded like a a comra- You know, he talks different. He he sounds different. And whether no, you people are, are suspicious of of, of education. I don't mean that sounds patronising, but but it's not the billionaires that own the factories that people have a problem with when the factories close. It's the middle managers and the lawyers and the teachers and all the people that make them sign the forms and jump through hoops. And the, that's what represents the state and the status yeah, quo. Yeah, it's it's yeah. not these golden, gilded individuals riding roughshod over rights across the world. It's the person who you have to get past in order yeah. to get your permit or in order to get your unemployment check. Yeah, and, and, and we, exactly. And a lot of times, you know, the people, we call them back home, it's like Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Taxpayer. That's, that's the kind of the... Uh. the the euphemism you get and and you know they don't care about all this stuff all they care about is is the rent paid is there food and, in the, and, and he appealed to that he appealed and, to and it does the argument doesn't go any bigger than that and that's why a lot of this stuff goes kind of in the cloud uh, but hang on though how, how, how does uh, and uh, i mean it's all very well it's a, a bit of esprit de scalier on this but I'm, I'm, I'm learning more about some of these issues than i knew when i started the program today which is often the way but but things feel a little more urgent than they usually do if he put the word muslim in the wording of this ban which rudy giuliani has confirmed he wanted to do then he'd have been in breach of the first and probably the 14th amendments as well so it would have been chucked out as soon as it got Examine. So he's very yeah. carefully managed to bring in a ban on Muslims that isn't actually a ban on Muslims. How does that play to the people in the Midwest who are worried that their livelihood is slipping away and that they're... Because they're not affected by immigration no, in general. and I mean, they might be affected by jobs moving out of the country. But how does hurting a completely blameless Muslim... How yeah. does that hurt, or, or rather help, your, your American voter? Well, I think that it's it's a little bit of a, of a, a duck and cover in the sense that they don't they don't see it that way. But what they voted for and what they see and what they want is got nothing to do with that issue. They care about their jobs and they want they want to make sure they're okay first. And and then when they hear somebody going, well, you're going to be okay first. We're going to put you first. All the other side arguments they do tend to fall to the wayside. Yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I think what happened on Friday was it was insane in the sense that, and it's, it goes to my last point in that the way they've gone about it since he got in office, it's we have it's a term back home where I'm from called it's called a hacksaw policy. So it's you take the hacksaw to the to the situation when you might have needed like a really sharp scalpel in the sense that mm. if you nuance it a little bit and 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 thought some of it through the actual policy might not be that unpopular but you take a hacksaw to it and you just go boom over the whole thing and then it, it, it just it goes crazy bananas on the other side and and it, it really is hard to distinguish for somebody whose main fear in life is to pay the bills and yeah and no I, I i get that and, and this is as a journalist called chris arnard a-r-n-a-d-e photographer who's done amazing work in trying to track that it doesn't sell newspapers though and it's it, it's not sexy here's my problem and maybe you can help me out with this is i sometimes try to find things on which we can all agree right yeah which is kind of what you're describing as the position that's been completely squeezed out of these debates these days uh, areas on which we can all agree yeah and i'm afraid at the moment i'm not sure there are any because i would have said to you you don't punish people who haven't done anything wrong and yet which i agree with yeah but there's a lot of people who think we should be punishing all muslims yeah, but see, the problem is, is that is actually a very small percentage. But the percentage is it? How do you know that, Jeremy? Out. I know it gets distorted by social media because a lot of people with false names and funny avatars will say things that they probably wouldn't say to their own mothers. But how do you know? Because you know well, that there are loads of people out there saying, "Well, no, they've got no place in Western culture. They shouldn't be here." And Bannon, Steve Bannon, knows that he's playing to that constituency. Yeah. How do people like you and I, who appear to have quite different politics but a shared humanity, if you will, yeah. how do we know? how many of them there are because that's my big fear at the moment well some of that is uh, is on a leap of faith you do kind of have to take a leap of faith and well, look where that led people in the 1930s when they well, kind of said yeah. the same thing yeah. that we're saying to each other it is it's got to do with the times of uncertainty and the fear and everything and that plays into it but i do i do believe that if because a lot of times if you listen to the people on the extreme right and the people on the extreme left it's a lot of times it's the same people over and over and over again because if you watch these talk shows yeah 
ones that are on the on the fringes, not the middle ones that try to cover everybody, but the ones that are on the fringes of both sides. Yeah. They keep having the same people come back. They keep having the same guests come back. And it's the same people saying the same stuff, just louder and louder and louder and louder. Yeah. And so I do, I firmly believe, and I hope I'm right, that the percentage of the extremes is actually not that large. It's the, it's just... Yeah, the well, I, th I hope you're right as well, but it just doesn't feel like that. Stephen Bannon is one of these extremes, mate. Yeah, I mean, I didn't... His I, chief I, of I staff in the White House. He appointed him. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't agree with that one, you know. And it, 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 but it is what it is, and you know I can't do anything about that. I just you, know, it, you just have to try to kind of hope that common sense will kind of. But it's the, it goes back to your original point about the divisiveness. Yes, it, it's so bad. I mean, I, honestly, I had an argument with somebody. It's worse in America today than it was during slavery. Okay, really, it is. It, the, the country, well, we don't we don't we don't know that because we weren't around. But you mean well, it, yes, okay? But <laughs> you base it on historical facts, and and you know people write papers, and you you kind of try to. As you as you kind of try to look into the future, you have to kind of try to look into the past. And yeah. you look at the words written of the day and the things said about the other side of the day and yeah. everything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's worse today than it was during the Civil War. To, to, to clarify, you're not suggesting that what we're looking at now is in any way comparable to slavery itself. You're talking no, about no, no, the nature no, no. of debate. I, this isn't for your benefit. This is for the benefit of people listening. The nature of the debate between the abolitionists yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the Confederates is, is you're saying it's more toxic than it was then. It's more divisive and more toxic. There used to be, even then, there was an admiration. Uh, can I just say, mate, at risk of sounding a little bit inappropriate, I love your accent. Well, thank you. You're very I welcome. Before, actually, uh, <laughs> I thought you had. But I should. I should have listened more. To <laughs> um, but it, it, it's. It, it, there was a. There was an admiration to the other side. There was a mutual, at least, respect that. Yeah. It's gone. The it's gone. It's all gone. And until somehow we can get some of that back and try to find some kind of common ground, which is the is the part that I worry about the most. Yeah, me in too. All, in all honesty, because as as a conservative who's you know lives in a country that's predominantly at least the people in my circle is predominantly um on the other side politically but i can have conversations with these people yeah. my friends and my co-workers and my acquaintances and we can vehemently disagree on on an issue but then at the end of the conversation we can go talk about something else yeah you're right you know and you move on uh, yeah, depending on what's at stake you can yeah. you can move on yeah and that's dead isn't it it is, uh, and until we can get that back, and uh, now that's the part that scares me the most because I don't have an answer for that one. I do. You won't <laughs> be you, you, you won't be surprised to learn. I, I think you have to make people explain what they mean on whatever side they are. Obviously, yeah. I'm going to suggest, or, or I subscribe to the school of thought that they're on the same side as you, and you're going to say a lot of them are on the same side as me, and, and then we can have a long debate about what sides mean. But when he says "Make America Great Again," pin him down on what he means. When was it great? And then he'll name a year, and you can point out they still had slavery then or he'll name a year and you can point out or they say we get our country back these these phrases all throughout history whether from the left or the right totalitarian ambitions are fulfilled by by powerful but meaningless slogans and this isn't your job this is the job of journalists we should be asking people precisely what they mean when they use certain words why has steve bannon got a problem with asian ceos of silicon valley companies keep asking him that question what difference does it make if their parents were from hong kong or from Wyoming and push and push and push and push and then you get an answer and then you know where you are and you can pick a side but at the moment we're picking a side based upon scaremongering and sloganeering and that, that probably in the great scheme of things doesn't help anybody nuance is lost nuance is gone yeah and and that's I'm, I'm so late for the travel news jeremy you're, you're gonna you, you, I'm, literally I, it's, it's, it's <laughs> i've got to go now because there'll be people stuck in traffic wondering what the hell is going on but there you go so self-declared republican uh self-declared uh christian democrat <laughs> all right then a self-declared liberal agreeing that nuance is lost it's 10 to 12. There's a tiny little bit of me that worries slightly when I turn up at 10 o'clock in the morning, turn on the switchboard, and it's full until 1 o'clock, and we only talk about one subject. But actually, callers like Jeremy, the last one, <laughs> whose accent I admired so much, um, to move the debate along. It's not like we come on at 10 o'clock and ask a really binary question like, do you like Muslims? <laughs> we come on at 10 o'clock and ask quite a nuanced question. Like, what do you think Donald Trump is actually up to? And there's no way you can answer yes or no to that question. You might answer positively, I think he's doing something great. Or you might answer negatively, I think he's doing something awful. And then as the conversation progresses, sometimes the questions change. But this one still underpins everything else. This notion of, what do you think he's up to? Because 
most of the arguments suggesting that he's not doing something dodgy can be unpicked fairly quickly, not least by his own allies, by Rudy Giuliani saying, yeah, he asked me to see whether or not it would be legal to have a full-on Muslim ban. It's as if they found a way of passing this off as something other than a Muslim ban, because they had to legally. And if you think that sounds a little bit unnuanced, to nod at Jeremy, have a look at the White House website and how they define the Department of Government, because they've removed one. They've removed the judiciary. It might just be that I've misunderstood, or it might just be that there's some sort of error there. But you know, the, 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 the tripartite state, the three platforms of democracy, the, the executive, which enacts law, the legislative, which passes law, and the judiciary, which supervises and scrutinizes law. The judiciary has moved, it's gone from the White House description of what government is. And we could sit here and get all superior. That's outrageous. The rule of law is absolutely sacrosanct until we remember that the second best-selling newspaper in this country described judges as enemies of the people when they scrutinized the law and made a decision that the editor didn't like. Echoes everywhere. 11.56 is the time. Back to Cambridge. Ian is there. Ian, what do you think the president is up to? Um, well, I was just listening to a thing about fake news. Yeah. And, and I was just reminded of a Rich Hill documentary. And he said, before the days of photography, candidates were just by journalists to write any old baloney. Huh? And, uh, and, and one candidate hired a journalist to write that his opponent is dead, which is the best bit of fake news ever. I remember that. I remember that. I remember that story. I know I've done. I've worked with Rich a couple of times. I, he's a brilliant guy. But the, the, I remember that, and it just got around that the candidate was dead, so he didn't get the vote. People just thought I, I can't vote for a was, dead guy. I think it was someone respected, like Hamilton or Jefferson. I think you're well, right. You know. So fake news is as old as the hills. It was a little bit harder to get it into your sitting room back in the day than it is now, but still. And, and, and also, I think it's Emperor Hadrian who, who tried to conquer Caledonia, and he didn't. He came back and he just winted a coin, saying he was I was uh, there. the Caesar of Caledonia. <laughs> <laughs> that's not I mean, fascinating. Though your history lessons are, that's not what you rang in to tell me. No, no, I, I, I agree with you about him doubling down, uh, and, and I think he's happy to provoke civil unrest so he can exploit it in exactly the same way that Nixon and Governor Reagan did. Really? How did Reagan exploit civil unrest? I'm talking about when he was governor of California. Oh, all right, yeah, fair um, enough. You, you know, and, and also Nixon as well, that he was the one who can tell conservative America this country's out of control, and he's the one who's going to um, sort out these hippies and uppity civil rights protesters. And you have to remember, most of Trump's, Trump won amongst all high-income voters. So a lot of them are, are, are conservative you know, and they want stability, and they see a lot of um, rioting in streets of Seattle. Trump will, will send, you know, he wouldn't hesitate to send in the Federal Guard to show who's boss. He's already said he would, hasn't he? In Chicago, well, he, with bogus yeah, crime statistics, which he, he said he'd, he'd then send in the Feds. Yes, 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 he just declared threatened martial and, law. And right? why, why does civil unrest suit his agenda? Because he, he, his inauguration speech, he was divisive and joyless. He wasn't reaching out any more than Brexiters are going to, you know? So all he can do is consolidate his own support through the strongman image, through fear. And that is when people like us, and indeed Jeremy, the, 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 the Republican caller previously, are looking, are looking for rational reasons and, uh, uh, if you like, sort of, sort of logical nuanced explanations of why things are happening, we, we end up looking a little bit silly. We end up getting caught with our trousers down because it is just about shoring up the support. And that's the fear. And we're back to where we were at 10 o'clock, which is the idea that this looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. So it probably is a duck. <laughs> Substitute the word duck for neo-fascist, Nazi, whatever you want to do. But then look at what some of Donald Trump's key allies say about the fact that Silicon Valley CEOs have family heritage in Southeast Asia is a really bad thing. And you know that you're never going to get your head around that. You either completely agree or you'll never understand it. Just sort of, I, I, do you know how I make the decision on whether or not to crack on with the same subject for three hours? Breaks all the rules of phone and radio, but hey, 810,000 people can't be wrong. The, I just, it goes by how I feel at 12. I'll have a quick chat with Caroline. And we sort of see, does it feel like we've been on air for two hours? It feels like we've been on air for about 20 minutes, James. 
OK, let's crack on with this subject then. Sometimes the stories are so huge you cannot help but talk about them. It's weird because on Friday, I didn't do the show on Friday, I had to go to the hospital. I'm off tomorrow as well, actually. I've got, I've got to go back for, a, for an extra. Everything's fine, everything's moving in the right direction. This is a special message for my mum in Kidderminster. Everything's fine, mum. If I can't get through to you later today, do not panic. It's just the NHS appointment schedules by some uh, appalling coincidence all clashed with when I was supposed to be on air. But I was doing one of my other jobs. On, on Friday night, and so I was still plugged into the news, still plugged into social media, and the suggestion was, oh, we need to move on from Trump now. And I was beginning to agree. I was beginning to think, yeah, let's settle down, see what happens, talk about other stuff. And then, boom, Muslim ban. It's not a Muslim ban. Well, no, but he said there was going to be a Muslim ban. He tried to bring in a Muslim ban. He got told by lawmakers that it would be illegal to have a Muslim ban, so he cobbled together this seven-country ban, which <sighs> doesn't really stand up to scrutiny, although I'm waiting for the pertinent intelligence documents to be sent to me so that I can um, uh, perhaps challenge my own conclusions on that. It doesn't look to me to bode well if Rudy Giuliani is on the record as saying Donald Trump asked me to look into the legality of an absolute blanket ban on all Muslims coming into the country. But the call that's sticking with me is Jeremy. Republican, American, from, I would guess by his accent, the south of America, Confederate country, self-declared right-winger, but as perturbed as I am by the disappearance of nuance from political debate. And, and this is my two penneth on that, or two cents worth, just to be equal opportunities. Is it possible that we've allowed the debate now to be defined and driven by the two sides that just want to beat each other up, rather than, in my optimistic opinion, my optimistic opinion, um, the 80% who sit between the two extremes? or the 70% that sit between the two extremes. So you've got that constituency of, of Western commentary, which is saying, shoot them at the borders. Steve Bannon published that in his website when a German politician wrote it. Shoot them all, kill them all, chuck them out, let them drown. And then at the other extreme, you've got your actual Islamist jihadists saying, the great Satan, the West is our enemy, kill them all, they must die, they must burn in the fires of hell. And somehow, by a form of horseshoeing, we've allowed that to define the debate. And even relatively well-meaning people like me then come to the debate and buy into that binary worldview. So by standing up to the people on the Western side who say, kill them all, shoot them all, you get cast absurdly and utterly fraudulently as somehow being in support of all the people on the eastern side saying kill them all, shoot them all. If only we could find a way, and media isn't going to help with this, is it? Not unless we can find a way of uh, reinventing the wheel. If only you could find a way of, of, of separating, of just letting them duke it out. Not nuke it out, not with Donald Trump in the White House, but duke it out. So the people who think that... that Islam, Islamist culture is incompatible with white supremacist culture are right. Of course it is. But most of us who are white are not white supremacists. And most of us who are Muslims are not Islamist supremacists. So let the supremacists thrash it out together and God leave the rest of us alone for a while, will you? Let's get on with loving our children and raising our families and paying our bills and doing our jobs and trying to improve society for the benefit of everybody. Islamist supremacists, white supremacists, they're running the world. They're running the news. They're running everything. Let them drown, kill them, shoot them, let them die. It's white people. Burn them in the fires of hell. America is the great shaitan. They are infidels. Die scum. Islamists. How many of us actually subscribe to either of those schools of thought? No idea. I'm still with Jeremy. I'm hoping there aren't many. 24% of the world's population are Muslim. If they wanted to blow the place up, they'd have done it years ago. Tiny, tiny minority. My fear is, and this is because of my own box of trolls and the own stuff that I'm exposed to, on a... Oh, right, every time I begin to feel a little bit sorry for myself with the scale of the vitriol that's chucked at me, I just look at what they do to women and people of colour and I realise I get off scot-free. Have a look at Lily Allen's feed. You want to see what really ignorant trolling looks like. But I get exposed to a little bit more than is normal, so I worry that actually there are probably more people on the white supremacist side calling for all people of a, of a different faith to be rounded up, corralled and chucked out of a country or worse than I do the Islamist side, who are murderous scum, but not representative of 24% of the world's population. <laughs> I can't believe I even have to say that out loud. How do we break that horseshoe, though? 
How, how do we put the two extremes of the horseshoe in a box and leave them just to thrash it out together without compromising the lives and the safety of the rest of us? Because these things, if they do end in war, they end with our sons being sent to fight. Wars they don't really understand. First World War, ah, man, between two countries whose leaders were cousins. It's nine minutes after 12. Joshua is in Manor Park. Joshua, what would you like to say? Hi, good afternoon, James. Um, the, the essential point I wanted to bring forward is the fact that I think at the moment that we're thinking too much into this situation. Um, <laughs> well, you and I can say that. I think if we, if our child had just been carted away at customs at JFK Airport and we didn't see them for six hours, we probably wouldn't think we were overthinking the issue, would we? Well, it depends. Um, well, see, <laughs> the, the point of the matter is, obviously, he, he's the new president and uh, he wants to be able to show to his supporters that he's a man of action and obviously he's going to be judged in what he's achieved in his first 100 days in office. So he's picking all the low-hanging fruit. He's picking all the things that he, he said that he would do in his campaign that he could do quickly and easily. He, he's doing those first, and he's getting them registered. And he's, he's getting, obviously, a lot of media attention, which will obviously imprint in their minds how effective he is as a president. Because he's... Well, a that, I mean, actually, that, that, that's not overthinking. That's an interesting analysis. So where does overthinking come into it? Well... <coughs> Do you mean over over worrying? Do you think we're worrying on yeah, Julie? That's what I meant. Because okay. He's he's not really against Muslims. What these agenda is to actually get America to descale their militarism around the world. That's what his long game is. But that's he's actually up against the establishment, and he said that he was going to go up against the establishment. Darkness so is good. Go, Darkness right? is good. Dick Cheney, Darth Vader, Satan, that's power. It only helps us when they, the liberals, get it wrong, when they're blind to who we are and what we're doing. Guess who said that? I don't know who said that, James. Can't have a guess. I don't know who said it. I can't guess. <laughs> <laughs> nor, nor would I. Nor would I if someone hadn't just tweeted it to me. But I've checked the provenance of it. This is the man that you... This is Steve Bannon, mate, who's pulling Donald Trump's right. strings. And okay. I think... I think you're encouraging me to fall into this bit here where he says it only helps us when the Liberals get it wrong, when they're blind to who we are and what we're doing. I think you're saying to me, James, be blind to who we are and what they're doing. There's no way it's as bad as you think. No, no. He doesn't want you to be blind. That's, this, that's, his, that's his double game. That's his double speak. He knows what he's doing, and he, he's only worried about the people who can uncover what his long game is that are actually on his other side, uh, that is his enemies. Because don't forget, he's trading a, a, a very uh, fine line at the moment. You know, in America, presidents can be assassinated, and he knows that he's very vulnerable according to what he's trying to accomplish in his... Well, he's no more vulnerable than Barack Obama was. I mean, you look at the white supremacist, that's, white supremacist rhetoric that's going great guns now, and, and uh, I, I think he is. All, all leaders, all politicians are vulnerable to a degree to, 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 to violence and assassination attempts and, and death threats, but I don't think it's going to be part of Donald Trump's thinking. Does that not stop you in your tracks, that line there? Not really, because... Um, what is easy? But, but this is his chief of staff saying, yes, we are Darth, we're Darth Vader. I mean, I did, I, I did a tweet last week, I was joking. I said, it turns out we spent half our life watching Star Wars films in cinemas where half of the audience wanted Darth Vader to win. I hadn't even seen that tweet at that point. Turns out Steve Bannon really did want Darth Vader to win. Right. But the point I'm making is that he's using the techniques of the dark side for the power of good. That's what, where he's really clever. Who is? Donald Trump? No, yes, exactly. He's for the power of good? Yes. Okay. Well, he's we got there in the end. He's been, trying, he's been trying to get into the White House for, for over 12 years, yeah. right? And he's been think, strategically planning this move and decided when he was going to run, right? And he was going to run before this. And no, he, you, he you, you, you rang in to tell us. We were, was it you that said we were overthinking it? And now you're telling us about the 12-year plan that was secretly underway throughout. Do, do you know why Donald Trump ran for president? Sorry? I'll tell you why Donald Trump ran for president. It's because he was renegotiating his deal with the television company that made The Apprentice, and they weren't coming across with the kind of money that he thought that he deserved. So he announced a sort of putative presidential run as, a, as an attempt to sort of force their hand. They called his bluff. 
And after some of the comments he made as a putative presidential candidate, said, well, we can never work with him again. So he, like all egotists and narcissists throughout history would do, he absolutely doubled down on his original position. And the next thing you know, he's in the blinking White House. Why? Because he got Steve Bannon on board really, really early. Who's Steve Bannon? Steve Bannon is the bloke that Joshua thinks is employing the tactics of Darth Vader, but using them for good. Yeah, but Steve Bannon yeah, but... Isn't, isn't Steve Bannon isn't the actual one that funded um, um, uh, Donald Trump. I don't care who funded him, mate. I care who's pulling his strings, and it's becoming increasingly clear. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine. 73 is the number that you need. And the question is, what do you think he's up to? And the answer, I, I mean, it, it, it's actually becoming irresistible. Like for all the kind of arguments about, oh, it was, it was Obama's intelligence that did, as soon as Rudy Giuliani came out and said he asked me to look into a Muslim ban, ban them all, which he said he'd do. I mean, you want to talk about overthinking and overanalyzing, Joshua. Overanalyzing is going back and trying to argue still that he didn't really mean what he said. He meant every flipping syllable. He didn't know why he meant it. He just did whatever Steve Bannon told him to do. And whenever Donald Trump turns around to Steve Bannon now and says, hey, come on, isn't this a bit much? What does Steve Bannon say? Did following my advice get you into the White House, Donald? Or did following my advice get you into the White House, Donald? That's not binary. It's 12.15. Simon Marks has been doing sterling work for LBC now for almost as long as I can remember, but it turns out even longer. I, Simon is on the line now from... America, where, of course, Donald Trump has just woken up. I did Newsnight on Friday, and my producer used to work with you at LBC, Simon. Small world, eh? Really? It's, it's a very small world, I kid James. you not. Seriously. It's astonishing. Anyway, where have, are we? Did they have uh, embarrassing stories? No, I, I can't possibly reveal that on air. Not until after the watershed. <laughs> now, what's going on this morning? Uh, well, Donald Trump's about to wake up. Uh, the sun is just rising here in Washington, D.C., so we are braced for what may be a tweet storm. Who knows what he's going to unleash on social media next. Uh, and he finds himself uh, on the receiving end of headlines here that are talking about a crisis. The New York Times uh, describes this as a crisis as he goes into only the second full week uh, of his presidency. But I am a bit reminded of that old Jim Callahan phrase, crisis, what crisis? Because if you listen to the way the White House officials are spinning it, they uh, seem remarkably serene about not just the domestic protests that are taking place uh, and the legal challenges to what Donald Trump has done, but the global reaction to it as well, including, of course, uh, the extraordinary number of people that have now signed that petition. Uh, on your side of the Atlantic, senior administration officials say that the implementation of this ban has been a huge success, an enormous success, they say. Well, why would they say that? Uh, the answer, of course, is because they believe, and they've almost certainly seen uh, polling data to suggest that among Donald Trump voters in all yeah. those states that voted Trump and put him in the White House, this is popular. You've actually got something we haven't seen in Washington for a good long while. A president who made promises on the campaign trail got to the White House and then started implementing well, them. The, the, here is the, the, the nub of it, really, in that for all the outrage and all the fury and all the sort of perceived echoes of, of, of 1930s politicking. He did say he would do this, and he said he'd actually go further. He was going to ban all people yes. on the basis of their religion, which is probably the first regime on the basis of their religion. It would be the first regime to do so probably since Adolf Hitler's, and, and yet wh wh why the outrage? He said he was going to do it, so this is playing out great for and them. And he may well go further. The White House Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus, in a deeply confusing interview on NBC yesterday, in which it was clear he had no understanding of the precise detail uh, of these uh, regulations. And, and we now know, by the way, that this executive order never went through any kind of judi Justice Department review, as would be normal. They never sent it over to the Justice Department before they published it and said, here, take a look at this and just make sure it's, it, it's kosher, make sure it passes must. Reince Priebus on NBC yesterday suggested that it's possible there may be more of this in the future, that he may indeed uh, move further down the road of making good on that promise to close America's borders, not just to people from seven countries, but to all Muslims. But there is a, a problem that should be nagging away uh, in the minds of the White House, and that is on Capitol Hill. 39 U.S. senators from the Republican side of the aisle, and remember there are only 52 senators, 52 Republicans in the U.S. Senate, 39 of them now say they either oppose what Donald Trump has done God. or have reservations about it. 
It's only been 10 days and he's already squandered uh, a substantial uh, amount of support that he did enjoy from his fellow Republicans on Capitol Hill. Because they had their fingers crossed and they bought into the take him seriously but not literally narrative, which is looking increasingly broken. And, and also, James, because I think there's also a sense of maturity uh, there that you don't have at the White House. Whatever you think of this uh, executive order, whatever you think of these restrictions, you can argue these restrictions are justified, but you cannot argue, and, and no one outside the Trump White House argues, that these restrictions were competently unveiled and competently put into place. It has been chaos at airports with immigration agents unsure how to implement them, embassies unsure how to handle them, uh, airlines worried about no, being I stuck can, with the bill. I can help you, know, you here. And, and that, it's the competence issue, uh, you know? No, 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 Simon Marks. You clearly haven't read <laughs> the latest tweet from from the President of, of America. Oh, is, he, is he up? He he has tweeted. I don't know when this one was tweeted, but he has addressed this point you make about alleged incompetence and he says it has it only 109 people out of 325,000 were detained and held for questioning big problems at airports were caused by go on have a guess protesters nope hmm. <laughs> striking taxi drivers <laughs> refusing to uh, service the airports go on tell me delta computer outage Oh, the Delta computer outage, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Oh, that explains it, yeah. Just, but we can laugh, I guess that's because we're part of the liberal mainstream media elite or something, but, you, you know, you just described reality. The President of the United States of America has just tweeted the opposite yes. of reality. And, 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 and let me also just say, James, you know, he talks about 109 people being detained. Yeah. This is not a White House that, in its first 10, ten days, has proved to be particularly uh, adept at disseminating facts. So I think those numbers are going to have to be checked uh, very rigorously. It doesn't matter. I've already had callers repeating them to me. So in, in many ways, that kind of Breitbart model of journalism is now the mm. mode of government information dissemination in the, in the White House. Are you going to move back to Britain, Simon? <laughs> you got you got some space in the basement. <laughs> anytime, uh, you, mate. Anytime. See, it's <laughs> worth making the point, too. Did you see the point that Stephen Bannon is now going to be on the National Security Council but the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the director of national intelligence, people who you would think would be on the National Security Council, have now been told that they no longer need to attend those meetings. Yeah. Happy days. <laughs> See you soon. Stay safe. Simon Marks, Feature Story News, one of the um, world's leading independent news agencies and a very kind and welcome, valued contributor to LBC. You're listening to James O'Brien on... LBC 03456060973 is the number that you need, and and there you have it. It is actually out there. I mean, actually, while Simon was speaking, I think this tweet dropped, and he said, "We wait to see what the tweet will be." And now he is claiming that all of the chaos, all of the people who were, and and I had a caller earlier already. He said 110 people, and and I'm thinking, where's that coming from? Where's that number coming from? That it was caused by a Delta computer outage. Had nothing whatsoever to do with the executive order that his own chief of staff didn't really understand. And, and again, you know, at risk of barking up the tree, this has been explained by Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump's consigliere of sorts. Rudy Giuliani has said he asked me to look into the legality of a Muslim ban. When he got the message that he wouldn't be able to push a Muslim ban through either Congress or the Constitution... <sighs> the Constitution. He decided to come up with something new, and they came up with this. Wow. 03456060973. And the Saudi Arabia ban? Well, if you can find a serious investor building massive infrastructure or building huge uh, projects anywhere in the world who isn't in hock, i.e. inviting investment from either Saudi or China... I'll be amazed, absolutely amazed. Even Rupert Murdoch, his sec the second biggest shareholder in Rupert Murdoch's empire, was a member of the Saudi Arabian royal family. Once you're moving into the 9-0 territory, there's hardly anybody on the planet who can help you out if you want to build something. So why isn't Saudi Arabia on the list? Well, not only does Donald Trump have business interests in Saudi Arabia, I would be amazed if he wasn't servicing debt to some senior Saudi royals as we speak. And why don't they have a problem with this ban on people from seven other Muslim countries? Well, 
look at what they have in common with Vladimir Putin and increasingly with Donald Trump. The only way you can keep a kakistocracy or a kleptocracy or a totalitarian regime in place, the only way you can keep it in place is by fermenting unrest and disorder on your own doorstep. On your own doorstep. Saudi exports terror. It enhances their hold on power. Vladimir Putin invades Crimea. It enhances his hold on power. Donald Trump bans Muslims arbitrarily from America. It enhances his hold on power. Why? Two reasons. Number one, creates an enemy for the chomping mob to focus on instead of focusing upon the throne, which is where the Ukrainian fellow went wrong. Didn't have enough distraction techniques in place, so when the population in Ukraine finally got a handle on how corrupt he was, it was curtains for him and his golden pirate ship, whatever it was. Second reason, second reason, you ferment unrest, ideally on foreign streets, but if necessary on your own, and the architects of the unrest become the focus of the population's anger, rather than the actual creators of the unrest, which is the regime under which everybody is living. Curious, sir. Curious, sir, said Alice. So no sooner do I mention to you that the uh, fellow who used to be one of Rupert Murdoch's key investors, he, he, he currently owns about 1% of the company, um, a member of the... Saudi royal family. Now, no sooner did I su suggest to you that it would be almost impossible to conduct the sort of business that Donald Trump conducts around the world without investment from either Saudi Arabia or China, then I am shown tweets that have been sent by the Saudi Prince Al Walid bin Talal, the man of whom I spoke, and in them he states, and remember, you could sue him if you wanted, he states, in response to the notion of a so-called Muslim ban, Donald Trump better realize who I am. I financially rescued him twice. There are two stories attached to this tweet. One involves him buying a um, yacht that had been... Uh, well, somehow Donald Trump had managed reportedly to run up a $900 million debt on this yacht. And Al, Al Walid... Um, bought it. He's tweeted this. You can check. I don't know whether it's true or not. I, I can't see what he's got, what reason he's got to lie. Um, and of course, if you're a great believer in the veracity of Fox News, then the fact that this fellow owns 1% of it should add to his credibility. Uh, he had to buy Donald Trump's yacht, which had recently been turned over to creditors when it fell a staggering $900 million in debt. This is all on the record. And the second one involves um, one of his hotels. This was reported as a defeat for the real estate developer. The New York Times reported that Al Walid had also bought a hotel, the Trump Plaza Hotel in New York, after um, promising to erase the mogul's debt. So he got it for about $25 million while promising to remove $300 million of debt. So look, by all means, buy into the notion that, that you know, he, he's something other than what his harshest critics describe him as. But it's your job then to explain to me why Saudi Arabia isn't on the list and a prominent member of the Saudi Arabian royal family has bailed him out in the past on hundreds of millions of dollars. There's a figure in Greek mythology called Cassandra, and she makes predictions. So she's a prophet, prophetess, but she's been cursed by the gods. So all her prophecies will be true and none of them will be believed. I don't think even she made a prophecy before the news and then proved it to be true after the news and still goes unbelieved by huge swathes of the population. There he is, the man himself. Anti-Saudi, anti-terrorist Donald Trump bailed out twice financially by a member of the Saudi Arabian royal family. Maxwell's in Hounslow. Maxwell, what would you like to say? Good afternoon, James. Uh, you did clear up a lot of my points there just before... Um, you Shut up. You didn't know all that. Get lost. I, guys. I, I, knew, I, knew, I knew all of that, James. All right, then. I'm here well, analysing you... the whole situation and just chuckling away to myself, not knowing whether I've gone crazy or this is actually happening. Um, the point I wanted to make is, uh, you know, as a Muslim British person here, uh, I always remember my, my mother saying to me that, you know, we could one day it's going to turn around and there's going to be this, you know, the separation and Muslims are going to be asked to leave or Pakistanis are going to be asked to leave. I know I used to laugh to myself, you know, I'm grown up British, I'm Muslim, love Man United, you know, I'm as British as they come. But still very close to my religion, Islam is very precious to me. Um, 
and it's given me a lot of direction in my life. And it's just scary, you know, I can see that this is a real situation now. We could have a, a Chechnya or a Bosnia situation unfold on our hands. How you know, do you mean? What do you mean? What, what, what do you mean a form of ethnic cleansing? A form of ethnic cleansing, absolutely. This is, this is the first steps of that, James. Um, we can't deny it. And it isn't like it's just Donald Trump. It's been 15 years of constant, since the 9-11 attacks, you know, I think we can say that was the line in the sand that drew it. Up until then, you know, there, there, didn't, there were small issues here and there, but since then, 15 years of straight bombardment by, you know, whether it's the media or corporations or the military industry, whoever's doing it, they've taken Islam completely demonized it a absolute minimum well, let's not let, let's not uh, overlook the role of osama bin laden and his ilk in that process this is this is what they wanted to happen as the well people, these are the same people yes. that held osama bin laden's hand and and shook their hand and used him and go look at uh, the movies they used the media very well to push this thing look at rocky sorry not rocky it was <laughs> rambo where they were idolized and made to be the heroes in the film just like in Rocky IV. The Mujahideen, the because they were fighting the Russians. Exactly. They, they chop and choose these people at the top. They chop and choose. They'll make these people are cartels. We don't associate ca uh, Catholicism with the Mexican drug cartels. No, but we, we used to. We used to associate Catholicism with the IRA. I mean, I don't think I ever feared ethnic cleansing as a, as a young man with an Irish surname growing up in in Britain, but, but I, I mean, that also most Muslims don't fear it at, at this point in time, and please God, they never do. No, no, no James, I, from my point of view, from my friends, yes. from my cir circle, it, 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 we feel it. We feel a pressure on us. Islam is so demonized. The positive aspects of Islam are never talked about. We have to fight and die to make a positive point. Killing an innocent person is wrong in Islam. You know, the biggest jihad is within yourself. It's a struggle with the self. It's not a struggle with trying to impose. These same organizations are the same organizations that are killing Muslims also. You know, there's attacks in Turkey, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan. They're affecting Muslims more than they're affecting non-Muslims. And it's just a very... And, and, and of course, when there are terror attacks in Europe, there are always Muslim victims of those as well. So you, not only do you run the risk of getting blown up by an Islamist terrorist, then if you manage to survive the attack, you're going to get blamed for it. Exactly. Um, you know, and Donald Trump, the man is an enigma. You'd like you were picking, um, picking him apart just there with the, his association with the Saudi royals. James, we could sit here all day, my friend, I promise you, and we could pick up story after story. This guy is an absolute con, and he's just blagged it, basically, all the way to the top. And I've been sat back chuckling. It looks this strange. I followed Donald Trump his whole career as a child. You know, his, his role in Home Alone movies, his suspect activity with everyone. I remember there was the... Uh, ICN project he was back in a few years ago and someone did a pitch to me and they were like oh we're supported by Donald Trump this was a good five years ago I go that would never encourage me to follow anything the guy's an absolute con and um, you know it, it's just very strange to see how he's managed to dupe everybody into believing that he's this extremely successful but it's not uh, strange at all I, I mean, the problem is that, 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 that I don't know what word to use what adjective to use but people people um just presumed, because these websites, I've looked at them now a little bit more than I have done in the past. I've looked at Breitbart and I've looked at Infowars and I, 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 people have asked me in the past, why didn't you shoot these people down at the time? I, I honestly didn't think you needed to pick a debate yeah. with people arguing yeah. that the American yeah. government is changing the constitution of fruit juice cartons in order to turn the population gay. I just didn't, it would have been a bit like me oh, dedicating a program to proving that the moon isn't made of cheese. James dismantles caller who believes moon is made of cheese. I can't believe it was necessary, but it's too late now. Yeah. But James, I think that at the same time, these guys like Alex Jones, like David Icke, they push things over the edge. They, they follow the trail to a point and then they change it somewhere else you know i think yes there is a corporate agenda uh, you know to kind of push plastics chemicals it's the chemicalization of everything yeah there's definitely an agenda there we're polluting our world we're polluting our environment but they're not trying to turn our kids gay by changing the composition of, of their just juice cartons um maxwell mind how you go I, and i mean that you see you, you, there's a young man he's in hounslow um same borough of london as me although i'm at the leafier end and he is worried that his ethnicity is going to make him a target for hatred. And anybody who gets in touch with me now to tell me that, oh, that's ridiculous, da 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 I just click on their social media account, and two tweets down, I will find evidence that actually he's right to be worried. 
that if these people feel empowered enough to come out from behind their eggs, to shrug off their dirty bathrobes, put down their Tesco laptop and emerge from their mum's spare bedroom and actually start putting their ludicrous words into action, then he's right to be worried. He's right to be worried. And I don't know how much comfort Maxwell can derive from the suggestion that this is somehow a, a ban that was orchestrated originally by Barack Obama or that in 2011, for six months, the application of uh, asylum from Iraq was curtailed because two terrorists were found to have been living in America. Their fingerprints were then found on bomb debris back in Iraq. I, I mean, does that comfort him? Don't worry, mate. This is all Barack Obama's idea. But it wouldn't comfort me. Um, if you've been trying all day to get through and failing, I, I've got enough calls to take me up to one o'clock, but I've, I've got three or four phone lines free, so if you want to grab one of them, uh, you think you've got a point that desperately needs to be added, 0345 6060973 oh, is the number that you need. If you had said to me, even with my understanding of bigotry and race hatred and prejudice and even now of course sharing studio space with people that punt it on a daily basis if you had said to me a year ago that someone who lives in the same borough of london as me is worried that he might be ethnically cleansed i would have laughed in your face i'd have laughed my little liberal socks off and i'm not going to laugh now i think maxwell's wrong i think he's exaggerating but i can't mock what he feels and that is what he feels and now in tribute to jeremy the caller earlier, the Republican caller from the South of America, you also have to recognise, and I've always tried to explain this by detailing the difference between people who believe lies and people that I mentioned a moment ago who tell them for money is crucial because some people do fear that if a refugee were to move into their town, they'd run the risk of suffering a sexual assault. And when they go online looking for reasons to enforce their fears rather than to dilute them, there's so much there. I've got, I tell you again, I've been looking at these websites. If there is an alleged sexual assault in the middle of the Norwegian countryside, if it is even mentioned in passing by a witness that they think the assailant might have been brown or a Muslim or a refugee, that will be headline news on a website published in a country where three, one woman every three days is murdered, is killed. Or one human, actually, I think it includes men, is killed by a partner or a family member every two or three days. And yet you go on these websites and an alleged groping in a Norwegian wood gets higher billing than an actual rape and murder on your own doorstep. Why? Rape fugees. Oh, I said it wrong. It's such a ridiculous word. Rape fugees is the word that they use. So I also have some sympathy for them. Because if you've immersed yourself in this rhetoric of hatred and the effort that people like Stephen Bannon and his funny British equivalents put into demonizing all refugees, all Muslims, all migrants, the effort that's been put into it, we're not allowed to be surprised that it's worked. We're allowed to be apologetic that we didn't notice the effort being put into it. Do you remember that caller a few years ago whose wife wanted to say thank you to me because I just suggested to him that he put his laptop away for a month and after a month, turned out he didn't hate Muslims anymore because he kept like bumping into them in a shop or on a bus rather than reading about the faceless ones that are committing appalling crimes in, in, in Cologne on New Year's Eve. Yes, there were appalling crimes committed in Cologne on New Year's Eve. But they are exactly the same crimes that Donald Trump stands accused of by 14 different women. But that's just locker room talk by a big silverback gorilla. No, rape, sexual assault, murder, GBH, they are not colour-coded. They don't become worse. You're a victim of crime. You punch me in the face later today, it's not going to hurt less if you're white or hurt more if you're brown. Unbelievable. So no, I'm not going to laugh at Maxwell in Hounslow when he tells me that he is worried in Britain in the 21st century that people of his ethnicity could somehow be victims of ethnic cleansing. Because it happened in continental Europe. Places he cited were real. It happened. And how did it start? Casting people as somehow less deserving of the most fundamental protections and rights as other people. Untermensch, they used to call them. Now, the Iraqi parliament has voted in favour of a travel ban on Americans. <sighs> it's, it's, it's a bit like getting a kindergarten, isn't it? And sitting there with a cup of tea, watching the kids take lumps out of each other and thinking, I'll just let them get on with it. Problem is collateral damage. I don't know if you heard the thing. What time was it when I did the horseshoe business? 
Yeah. The extremists have got so much in common, they all just want to batter each other. Why can't we just leave them to it and the rest of us go on with living, loving our families, being excellent to each other, trying to be better people? We can't. Not with Donald Trump in the White House. <sighs> 03456060973 is the number to call if you just want to vent your spleen or howl at the moon or pick me up on things I've said today that you think are wrong. Glyn is in Waterford. Any or all of the above, Glyn, what would you like to say? Well, excellent show, James. Um, very kind. I'm carrying on from Sammy's call earlier, which I thought was brilliant, mm. and I'm hoping that this might be one of your pink bottom moments as well. Um, it's one of my what moments? Your pink bottom moments. I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I don't do, I don't do reverse revisionism of, of of callers, and absolutely, Sammy gave me something of a schooling. But I, I, the crucial points about why aren't Malaysia and Indonesia on the list? And I said because he has business interests there, and he said no they know he does it they actually do so there are 2020 hindsight is a wonderful thing but anyway go on spank away okay thank you very much well th it's just um on a site called uh, the foreign uh, the council for foreign relations is a washington think tank they released figures from the pentagon for the year of 2015 to 16 from pre under president obama's last uh, step up of bombing and ironically 26,172 bombs were carried out in these seven countries. The only one that wasn't was Pakistan, which possibly could be added to that list. And then interestingly... What do you mean, bo bo bombings by terrorists? No, bombings by the US. By the, so the Ameri Okay, carry on. Yeah the, yeah, the Americans carried out those bombings because he was trying to reduce tr troops, but he stepped up the bombings in the final year of of his presidency but then interestingly the u.s customs and border protection which you've alluded to 2011 yeah. in 2015 on june the 14th they reappraised the um the waiver for foreigners coming from these countries and said under the act travelers in the following categories are no longer eligible to travel or be admitted to the United States under a visa waiver program. Yeah. What were those countries? Those seven countries. Okay. Why did he ask Rudy Giuliani to establish the legality of a ban on all Muslims? I cannot answer that question. Okay, well, that's kind of the point. No. 12, 15, no, that, 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 that is it, isn't it? I mean, it, it, this is good with reverse ferreting, finding reasons. Oh, it's all Barack Obama's fault. It's all this, it's all that. Why did he ask Rudy? Well, okay, even then, Glyn, if, let's leave Rudy Giuliani out of it. Why did he say, while seeking to be elected, that he was going to ban all Muslims? Well, I, I can't answer that one either. Oh, okay, well, I can, because he wants to. David is in Banbury. David, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Oh. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for taking me on. Um, I think that the, the aspect of this that I think is most prominent in Bannon and Trump's mind is as a litmus test for uh, how much executive power they have. Yeah. I think, I think their, their, their key objective is to see if uh, the, the, the main agencies involved in the order, in implementing the order, are loyal to them or loyal to the judges. Um, and I think they've found their answer in in the uh, in the last couple of days by uh, uh, you know there was a there was a stay uh, issued by federal judges and and m many officers of the Department of Homeland Security refused to obey that stay. Yeah. So, uh, so he's, he's he's trying. He, this is envelope pushing. Yeah, and I, I, I was slightly heartened to hear your correspondent earlier talk about um, the number of Republican congressmen who've come out and now criticised this order. Yes. Um, I didn't think that was going to happen. I thought it was going to be John McCain and a couple of others that was going to stay there and they were going to stay silent yes. and prove that Congress was well and truly in Trump's pocket. Um, and then it would become a straight-up fight between the executives and the judges. But they're, they're going to look for the numbers as well, tragic and cynical though it is to say it. You know, th these are, these are well-rewarded positions that these people uh, enjoy. And, and one of the great mysteries that's been solved for me in recent months is understanding why people do the things that they do. Often it's as prosaic as paying the bills. So if it looks as though they're likely to lose their seat by standing against Trump, some of them will, re will retreat from that position. It, yeah, I, I think I think the next the, the next step uh, yeah. would be for Bannon and Trump to make a judgment about how how successful this litmus test has been, uh, and if it's been uh, if it, if it's proved that they have got power over the the uh, judiciary, then uh, then they'll start doing more extreme stuff. And the removal and the removal of that word from 
the White House website's description of how government functions, the removal of the word yeah. judiciary kind of plays into into what you describe. I I, uh, I think that the, the the alternative to that is that you start seeing a massive clampdown, at, at an enemies of the people style, uh, and it will start with journalists. Yeah, it will start with journalists. It will into judges. It will turn to four of whom I think have already been accused of felonies after that women's march last weekend and of course Stephen Bannon has come out and said the media needs to shut its mouth which if that's not the point at which you go crikey it walks like a duck it quacks like a duck yeah. it is a duck the media needs to shut its mouth this guy runs a website so when he says media he means people telling truths rather than the nonsense that I've been punting around the world for the last couple of years I'm, I'm weary of hyperbole but, um, so but it feels I. like a coup yeah. it feels like a coup um, it could be worse, David. In order to cheer you up, I would refer you to a BuzzFeed UK story that's just dropped. It, it details the experience of a very, very patient Scotsman called Steve Bannon, who keeps getting mistaken on Twitter for Trump's chief strategist. So it could be worse, David. It could be worse. My name could be Steve Bannon, yeah. And you could be bombarded with, uh, uh, well, I mean, he'll be getting some abuse. Christina is in Chelsea. Christina, uh, the last word to you on this. Uh, my apologies to everyone who's waiting to talk. I suspect we were returning to similar territory. What would you like to say? I would just like to say it's a fantastic show this morning, really enlightening, James, Thank with you. the real people. Um, it's just up to people like us and to you to keep calling him out because I don't know if you've seen Designated Survivor. My husband and I saw it for the first time yesterday and it was like watching a Trump in life. It, it was so frightening. Um, and he is calling the journalists and we've just got to keep shouting because he's so scary. I'm, I'm petrified. So I thank you for all um, your words of wisdom this morning and all your calls. Well, that says this is the point at which the box of trolls go apoplectic at what will be perceived to be a deliberately planted call, but I'll take the, co <laughs> <laughs> the compliments while I can. And let's have a little look in the box of trolls just to balance things out. Thank this you. one's this one's just Christina, thank you. This one's come on. I can't use all the words in it. Radio off. Um, and then a sort of figure of speech to describe a uh, a part of my bottom. It's amazing how many of these people appear to be obsessed with, with genitals and bottoms, but I love the idea that you've tweeted me telling me that it's time to turn your radio off at exactly 12.56, um, having listened for two hours and 56 minutes, which I suspect I should probably be more grateful for than I am. I